everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. The power of the computer code connected computers, internet, and related innovations in information and communication technologies has triggered massive advances in ideas and innovations that have over the years reinvented or are in the process of reinventing entire nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short referred to as NGIOA, its industries, sectors, governance models, business models, products, services, and more. While these developments created new opportunities, it also created new risk and none is greater than cybersecurity risk. The cybersecurity risk today present an increasingly complex set of security challenges for each and every entity across NGIOA as today's cyber attacks include but are not limited to stealing intellectual property, disrupting critical infrastructure, seizing identity, compromising online bank accounts, creating and distributing viruses and malwares, stealing and posting confidential information, and encrypting systems to demand financial payoff or ransom. These growing web of cyber attacks are complex, criminally or politically motivated, and are executed by very persistent, skilled, and well-funded individuals, groups, and organizations. Amidst these complex cybersecurity challenges, how do we achieve cybersecurity and secure cyberspace? How do we strategize cybersecurity? To discuss strategizing cybersecurity, I'm delighted to welcome Jim Jager. Jim is Chief Cybersecurity Strategies at Fidelis Cybersecurity and has previously held leadership roles at the National Security Agency, NSA, and Air Force, and has often been called in to brief intelligent uh, directors at various federal agencies, including the Department of Defense and CIA. Welcome, Jim. We are delighted to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you, Jay Shree. Wonderful, Jim. Uh, so let's begin by talking about the global shift that we are seeing. It seems that there is a profound shift, profound and possibly permanent shift in the relative balance of power among NGIOA as the connected computers, information technology and digitalization capability of information that are revolutionizing every aspect of society have leveled the playing field and brought each NGIOA an unprecedented possibility of progress. Do you think that in the level playing field across nations, each and every government, industries, organizations, and academia will be able to compete and lay a new foundation for lasting prosperity? That's quite a question. Uh, I think the, uh, the cyber world today gives the potential for leveling. Uh, whether we really realize that potential or not, I, I think demand depends on a number of things. Uh, one is actually infrastructure. Uh, the To access information and to be able to communicate and, and interact. Uh, fortunately, I think the infrastructure problem is getting easier. Uh, you know, we used to have to have large computers with with bandwidth to the home and and now so much of the information is available over mobile devices uh and that that infrastructure is is growing pretty rapidly uh certainly government policy becomes a factor uh do citizens have easy access to the information is information controlled uh is interaction between people uh, controlled but uh, the, today's cyber world certainly offers great potential uh, to level things uh, across nations and cultures. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is a great opportunity and uh, uh, is giving a level playing field to each and every nation. So no matter how successful they have been so far, or whether they have not been successful, it doesn't matter because now they have an opportunity to have a fresh start, and which is pretty amazing for you know uh, nations that want to that has a, that have a drive that has a drive to succeed and uh, do something meaningful, you know, as a nation. So, uh, in cyberspace, what is common to all is access to technology and information. 
But what is not common is how one uses that information for what purpose and goals in cyberspace, geospace, and space. So while computer code, connected computers, and internet has given nations the same starting point in access to technology and information, there are many other variables that determines whether a nation will be able to use the information to develop progress and succeed. Now, do you think that simply having access to technology and information is enough for a nation to succeed in cyberspace? No, unfortunately not. I, I think uh, leadership at, at multiple levels uh, becomes important. Uh, leadership that provides access to this technology to our youth uh, that's one area where I, I do think that the cyber arena has huge power uh, to, to provide access to educational resources in relatively remote and under, undeveloped, underdeveloped areas that wouldn't normally have access to kind of the leading edge of, of education. And, uh, but as, as you said, just the fact that those opportunities are there may or may not be realized because it does depend on the leadership all the way from from national level leadership uh, down through through villages uh, and and how villages come together to to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Yes, you are absolutely right. That does matter that you know we need leadership at all levels all across nations at every you know industry every you know government uh, every organizations and academia and even at the local levels like you say to make this uh, effective and to uh, have some meaningful progress now the revolution in information and communication technologies processes and connected computers is altering everything from how we communicate make friends to how we work bank shop and go to war the emergence of this whole new world of cyberspace has given each NGIOAI great promise as well as great peril and will offer each nation as many opportunities as it does challenges. Do you think that the emergence of this whole new world of cyberspace has leveled the playing field for na nations in reality? I mean, people do say that it's leveling the playing field, but does it actually level the playing field? I think that's a that's a huge question as to whether we will realize all of the potential that that's being offered today. The technology certainly provides the opportunity to level the playing field. Um, unfortunately, it also provides the opportunity for misuse by nations uh, and by criminal actors that want to take advantage of of people and and companies and organizations. So, uh, unfortunately, I think mankind has not changed a lot. Uh, cyber provides a, a new avenue uh, to play out much of the drama that's played out over the centuries. Yes, yes, it does. Now, uh, it seems that cyberspace has brought each NGIOA to a juncture of revival and reformation or inexorable decline as nations that have been built on exploitation are expected to fall in cyberspace, taking an entire corrupt system down. And the reason I say this is because if there is so much corruption, there is so much desire to have an autocratic rule and to have a dictatorial rule, then you do not provide enough positive environment you know, for your nation's youth to be able to understand these technologies, to be able to use it effectively, to you know work for progress and advancement of the nation. So if those things are not in place, then you know, None of these cyberspace opportunities, which are supposed to provide positive role in progress and advancement, is not going to happen. So the question is, what can each nation do independently and collectively to improve the competitive and innovative position in the world, thereby tipping the scale of cyberspace in its favor? 
Well, for those progressive countries that that really want to leverage the the opportunities and the power provided by cyberspace, providing almost entirely free access. I, I mean, free not from a, a cost. There's there's oftentimes some limited cost uh, associated with cyber, but but providing. A, unfettered access, I guess is what I really want to say, to both information and, and interaction. Uh, I think that's very key for, for any country that wants to rapidly move forward. The, the challenge is that, that repressive regimes can, for a time, close those doors to their people. And, and some repressive regimes have proven to be somewhat resilient. I, th I think in today's world, the hunger for information, uh, the hunger for technology will ultimately over, uh, overcome those repress repressive regimes. But uh, um, they've, they've proven to be frustratingly resilient uh, in some cases. Yes, they, they do, uh, but uh, there is a lot of hope that technology has power to bring really, you know, positive change and technology will be able to solve really big problems that we humans are not able to solve at this point because technology will remove a lot of barriers and, you know, individuals, the youth especially, will be able to access that information which is so very necessary for the, you know, progress and advancement. So. Uh, let's hope that it goes in that direction. Now, it is widely believed that the world will experience extraordinary changes in the next decade with growth as the only constant in those changes. In cyberspace, growth means more people, more devices, more connectivity, more data and more opportunities. There are reports that in next 10 years, more than 90% of people in developed countries and 70% of those in emerging economies are expected to be using the internet. Internet dependence will not just be a concept, but rather the new global age reality. So what implications do we see of these connected computers and growing internet dependence? Wow, that's a that's a huge question. Uh, I think you're you're absolutely right in in capturing some of those predictions about the the growth and and. Uh, uh, explosion in what connectivity uh, and and the increasing number of devices accessing the, the internet will do. Uh, I think the good news is that the technology will cert will support that. We've got the fundamental building blocks uh, uh, in place. Um, the challenge, I, I think, becomes that that access can be used for good or bad. And, and that's where countries uh, need to, to work together. Uh, and, and in many cases, we're learning those lessons. We're, we're seeing a lot more cooperation uh, internationally, in particular in combating cybercrime. Uh, I guess my biggest concern is that we don't try and overmanage uh, some of those problems because I, I think the power of the internet and and the pace with which it's grown uh, is largely because there hasn't been huge governmental controls on it and mm -hmm. and so I'd like to to keep that to a minimum but but I do recognize that governments certainly have a role to play. Uh, yes, th yes, they absolutely have a role to play. You are right about that. Now, nations are beginning to understand the implications of the rapidly evolving cyberspace expands for far beyond user counts, spanning economic, education, governance, and trade policies. While the relationship between the national policy and cyberspace is complex, the fa force and pace of technological change in the coming years will present complex challenges and opportunities for respective NGIOs, especially in the cyber warfare. What will be the nature of changes that we see at a global, national, and local level? 
I think probably the biggest challenge from a cyber warfare standpoint is is protecting the critical infrastructures that we all depend on uh, so so deeply. Uh, the electric grid, uh, the access to water, uh, it, you know, it, that's it's all controlled through cyber today. And so to some extent, we do become more globally vulnerable. We can be attacked from, from great distance. Uh, you know, it, it used to be that to attack a water system, you had to be physically present uh, in that local area. That's, that's not true anymore, uh, or the, uh, the electric grid. So I think that's where nations have a huge responsibility to to ensure that the critical infrastructures are safely protected, that their citizens depend on. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, we are in an entirely new world where even a single individual, even a high school student, or you know, a young you know teenager is in a position that if he's smart enough. He, and he has access to computer and knows, you know, coding and uh, uh, then he has an ability to, if he wants to do harm to other nations, he can do that. So this is a very, very different world where you don't, the war is not between two nations armies. The war could be from any different angle and which is very complex. And uh, I'm not sure if any nation is prepared for that at this point. Uh, but it seems, uh, Jim, that you just had been to the RSA conference uh, and uh, you spent, you know, quite some time over there. Based on what discussions happened at the RSA conference, what do you think are the emerging global cyber trends? And what do these trends tell us about the emerging cyberspace and cyber security? I think, fortunately, one of the uh, really emerging global trends is increased focus on cybersecurity uh, by governments, although that's not a huge dimension of RSA, but in particular by by industry, recognizing that that we have to do a better job of of protecting our information, our resources, and in particular uh, our clients uh, in a, in a business environment. Uh, what's amazing with RSA is the the number of, of companies and new technologies that that appear every year. It, it, RSA is just and, and, and RSA is just one of hundreds of cybersecurity conferences uh, uh, now going on around the world. Uh, I'll be speaking in London in May and June at cyber conferences. I'm speaking in Dubai uh, for the third time in the last three years. So, I mean, it, it, it's exploding across the world. There are some good technologies coming. Uh, there's also good recognition, though, that that for most, well, for any organization, uh, technology in in terms of protection cannot be the sole answer. Uh, it's people, uh, trained people, it's it's processes or policies, and it's technology. When you can put those three together, now you've got a, a chance at defending yourself. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is not just technology, it is people, processes, and the whole ecosystem that goes around the technology that is essential. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are you know, going to London and all these other nations uh, to uh, share your views on cybersecurity. I'm sure that you know all those nations are going to benefit tremendously from what you have to say. Now you are absolutely right that you know this uh, global you know trend is that people are you know taking uh, cybersecurity very seriously now because of the potential of the damage that it could cause. So it seems that each nation needs to understand and evaluate the global mega trends emerging in cyberspace to understand the impact or shape information and communications technology in general will have on NGIOA in CGS that means cyberspace, geospace, and space in the coming years. Will this global technology megatrend predictions 
be accurate enough that policy makers can anticipate how their choices and decisions taken today may lead to different future results in cyberspace do we have that uh, comfort or confidence that you know whatever trends we see are developing across nations in this field of cyberspace and cybersecurity they are accurate enough that you know proper effective policy decisions can be taken because policy decisions or policy planning is a very long and tedious process it doesn't happen overnight so what are your thoughts on that yeah that's a huge challenge for uh, i think governments in particular because as you noted the uh, um the pace at, at unfortunately the pace at which technology i'm sorry policy often moves is is it is is not at the cyber <laughs> yes cyber edge. it is a concern because technology is developing so rapidly and policies and everything else the processes the change management and adaptation and everything it is such a slow process so that is a real concern by a lot of people that in spite of you know us developing technology that we need in a very efficient manner the everything else around it is moving so slow so will we be able to benefit or take advantage of all that? So that is a concern. I, I think one of the ways that governments and international organizations can play a very positive role uh, in that policy arena is, is actually pro is providing guidelines rather than providing directive, prescriptive policies which unfortunately it can can be restrictive or, or can become limiters in this rapidly moving uh, arena. I, I think the the effort to establish guidelines uh, can be very very healthy, and and I would cite a, a number uh, in, of efforts in this area. The uh, the ISO standards for uh, cybersecurity uh, are very helpful. Uh, the uh, NIST framework, which the U.S. government put together, again, it, it, it's not a law; it, it's a it's a it's guide. Right. Yes, and I think those kinds of approaches can be very very helpful. Yes, you're absolutely right. Let's uh, it lets organizations and. Uh, whether they're businesses or schools or or even public organizations, it, it lets, if, if they don't have all of the expertise, it lets them go to the guidelines and and take what what is relevant and what applies to them. Yes, yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. But see, my challenge with uh, uh, this scenario is that, yes, the NIST is definitely doing a good work and, you know, they are putting together good light guidelines even though it is not you know everything that we would you know want or what nations need at this point because they are recommend they are you know giving recommendations that public private should work together but how they should work together do we have a framework by which you know uh, there is an ability for each and every entity across ngioa that means nations its government industries organizations and academia if they find some risks that are, you know, let's say independent, then yes, they have an ability to manage on their own. But if they find some cybersecurity risks that have interdependencies, then what is the structure? How do they, you know, flag that or, you know, process it in such a way that, you know, the right authorities or right decision makers come to get that information? So none of those uh, things are clear in the NIST guidelines. And I wish that, you know, we need a we need a framework, so security, cyber security, uh, risk management framework, where if we are able, if we have an ability to identify risks that have interdependencies, then we should have a structure by which we can, you know, take it forward and we are in a position to effectively manage that. But we don't have that at the, this point. And uh, secondly, that in, uh, in addition to that, I mean, each nation has their own NIST, you know, frameworks each nation have their own guidelines so now cyberspace is you know very different where we cannot have 100 i mean each country cannot have different guidelines 
and they can work effectively and we can effectively manage cybersecurity risk, there needs to be some global standards. And I don't see any effort or initiative in that direction at this point. So there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, actually, I think there are some, some pretty good uh, standards coming together voluntarily. Uh, the uh, again, the ISO guidelines uh, I, I think uh, are are increasingly widely uh, accepted. Uh, the SANS uh, consensus audit guidelines are something that have been adopted by by many, not only nations, but but many cybersecurity firms as as very useful tools. Um, that's what that's frankly what I like to see is is people coming together to, to solve problems uh, because I think if, if we try and do it too heavily through government we're, yes. we're just not fast enough yes you're um, absolutely right the uh, you know the sands uh, again and, and their name got tied to it only because they hosted the uh, uh, the meetings uh, and now there are a couple of other names. Other other organizations have jumped on those consensus audit guidelines. But uh, ten years ago, every security organization used a different framework to do uh, security audits. And people came together voluntarily and said, "We need a baseline." Uh, you know. It, Security audits do need to be tailored depending upon the industry and the infrastructure that that you're you're looking at, and even at the firm uh, that you're looking at. But uh, security experts came together voluntarily and developed, uh, as the title very appropriately says, consensus uh, audit guidelines. That's really good. That's really good to know. But Jean, I mean, I, I saw framework. Uh, I hear you on that. That that is very widely uh, adapted and you know accepted across nations. But I still see a problem with that. That there is uh, none of these frameworks that I evaluate has a proper structure to or framework for interdependent risk. That there are you know so many effective frameworks for identifying and evaluating and managing independent risks that any entity could face you know across nations across any industry but if there are there are so the whole thing has changed because of the cyberspace that there are so many interdependent risks where even though you are not responsible for that risk that and you have nothing to do with it but you know those risk interdependencies of it you know makes you vulnerable and there is no framework or guideline by which we can effectively manage that at this point well i i guess that's where philosophically I, I, again i i come down differently uh I, i'm just really concerned that if if we get too much governmental management here we will stifle the 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 pace of the the growth of the internet frankly another area that that voluntary uh, cooperation I think has proved hugely effective is in the law enforcement arena uh, the way international law enforcement organizations uh, both the international organizations and individual nations have come together to combat spammers and botnets to take down some of these malicious networks uh, I, I, the cooperation is pretty impressive Yes, yes, no doubt about that. I agree. I hear you on that, that the cooperation is impressive. And I hope that that kind of cooperation we can see in the field of risk management, in security risk management, uh, that we are all, you know, in this together. And it, this is not about government taking over or government playing a role in, you know, effectively managing the security risk. But this is about each nation, each industry, each you know, everyone coming together to effectively manage the interdependent risk that we all face, you know, because of the cyberspace. So I hope that that happens, you know, in the coming days and months. Now, while cyberspace is rapidly becoming a fact of daily life, almost overnight, interactions in this virtual domain have catapulted to the realm of high stakes politics and are at the forefront of almost every issue, every major issue that we see globally uh, these days. 
cyberspace today has become a source of great vulnerability posing potential threats to national security and disturbance of the pre-existing global order because of the you know vulnerability that cyberspace brings to each each and every nation uh, and gio i would say so what threats do you see to the global order at this point well i i think there's probably two that are of primary concern to me uh one is nation state cyber warfare, and the other is uh, use of cyberspace by, by terrorists to further their aims. Uh, both of those, we, we clearly need government involvement and to, to establish norms, establish what's ex acceptable. Uh, unfortunately, this, this again is where cyberspace just becomes a new domain to to play out the conflict that that's existed for centuries and yes yes so this is uh, giving them a platform to you know do something that they had you know the conflicts of all the centuries like you said you know that was there they are just getting a new platform to uh, take that fight over there. You are absolutely right now. As connected computers and the ecosystem that make up cyberspace are being, bringing nations complex security challenges, it is also true that in cyberspace and its ecosystem, any nation is only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. While many nations see an increased frequency of cyber attacks on its assets and has taken some measures to secure its digital assets and infrastructure, the effort seems only a drop in the ocean. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that, that's a tough question. Uh, we do, uh, I think, make significant progress, but uh, attackers in the cyberspace domain find new opportunities. And so I, I don't think we'll ever be able to rest on, on the progress that, that we make. And, and again, uh, some of that's technology. Uh, some of its people and, and uh, process or, or policy as well. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm most excited about seeing is the attention being put into uh, providing cybersecurity education to our youth. Uh, I think that goes, uh, I think that will pay huge dividends uh, in the future. Uh, the, there are so many good programs just starting to pop up. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the Cyber Patriot uh, National High School uh, Cyber Competition. There, there are, of course, our, our college uh, cyber competitions that even predate uh, some of the high school level competitions, but it, it's great to see us capturing young minds frankly before the dark side of the force captures them uh and and turns them to hacking i uh, i've had the opportunity to be the the referee or judge for the first three uh cyber patriot uh competitions and and frankly it, it it's amazing to watch these young kids as they compete uh, in in this competition, uh, each of the teams is given a network to defend. Uh, they have to configure it properly uh, for security, and and then attacks are launched against those networks. They have to detect the uh, attack, counter it, uh, and and restore the the services or, or capabilities. Uh, it, it's neat to see how excited these kids get it's, it's like sporting teams yes, yes. in the competition so the more of of that kind of thing uh that we can offer our youth today uh i think the the long-term payoffs uh, yes. will, will be huge Yes, you're absolutely right. Those are uh, really good initiatives uh, that needs to be carried forward. And I hope that we see more of that. Now, although cyberspace has the potential to transform NGIOA and overall society, there are possibilities of failure. 
a failure to fulfill the potential of technology to positively transform nations because of concerns about cyber security cyberspace is potential could be thwarted by protectionist economic policies and government resistance to rapidly changing technological environment which could inhibit cooperation and isolate nations instead of taking advantage of anticipated cyber led growth governments could restrict technology uh, trade and control the flow of information which looks like a real possibility across some nations this would have a very damaging effect to not only cyberspace but also the initiatives that we have in geospace and space what are your thoughts and observations well obviously that's a that's a huge concern um, and i don't know that uh, that we can control that or fix it, unfortunately, other than continuing to provide the example of, of what a, a powerful catalyst open cyber domains can be, uh, as you noted, for economic development, for education, for so many things. Um, Unfortunately, repressive regimes will will you know try to counter a lot of those advantages because they just can't live with them. So I think it's up to the rest of us to to really show how rapidly things can grow and evolve when you have a a more open access to information, more open. Uh, access to interaction between uh, countries, economies, uh, cultures. Uh, maybe, maybe the one downside of all of this that we have to worry about a little bit is uh, culture becoming too homogenized. Uh, you know, we we exchange things so freely today that I, I worry a little bit about some of the the really unique and, and beautiful aspects of of local culture being kind of overcome and lost right right culture that's transformation one, that's one that i'm not going to solve <laughs> yeah i think the, those kind of changes and adaptation takes years and decades and centuries probably nothing you know goes that uh, rapidly now let's talk about the cyberspace risk other than the cultural risk of course Cyberspace risks are not just from the commonly recognized sources such as cyber criminals, malware, or even state-sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, they can emerge from a nation's policies as well. Do you agree that uh, cybersecurity risks are not just technology risk and that uh, all these other risks we have to pay attention to, like, you know, uh, you said cultural risk and uh, network risk? Yeah, I think it, at... at both a, a national governmental level and at uh, a corporate uh, enterprise level and even at the citizens level, we do need to consider cybersecurity risk. I, I, you know, I think the challenge is knowing what to protect at each of those levels. Uh, we, we can't protect everything and, and that would become too restrictive. So, you know, what, what are the, the key types of data or information in, in various, I said levels, but it's, it's almost more domains or, or spheres that you need to protect. And, and then you build defenses around that data or those types, uh, those sensitive operations uh, to protect them. Yes, yes. Now, the, this is a, one other concern that I, you know, think very seriously about is that across nations, the approach to security is currently, especially about the cyber security, is currently largely reactive. Most of the industries and organizations, not just governments, do not give importance to securing their information data, are reactive in their response, and do not invest proactively in cybersecurity tools and technologies. This reactive response approach uh, limits the entire nation's ability to have a proactive cybersecurity risk management capability. This is a very critical risk. What are your thoughts on this? And observations, of course. Yeah, that's, that's a clearly the the heart of the matter 
for us. Uh, we we put a, a huge amount of focus on information sharing uh, and to some extent even threat intelligence uh, to solve this security problem. Uh, my teams do a lot of the big breach investigations that hacks into banks and credit card companies and technology firms. And one of the things that we really try to do is capture the lessons learned from the, those breaches and and I, that's why I spend a lot of time traveling and speaking is to get those lessons learned out to the cybersecurity community so we can we can better defend ourselves. Uh, but you hit on, uh, I think, on the, the key challenge. We're doing a pretty good job today of sharing information on attacks we we call them indicators of compromise the, the malicious uh, IP addresses that that hackers are using the malicious websites that have been compromised and, and are used by hackers the the malware so much of that can be formatted and exchanged very effectively what we're not doing well is looking at analytic trends exchanging those trends and and where we tend to fall down even the worst is is if you identify a, a cybersecurity trend or threat figuring out how that applies to each industry or infrastructure and and that's where i think we need to put much more of the focus we need to keep exchanging the indicators of compromise, again, the attack information, that's important, but that's relatively easy to do in an automated way. It's yes. threat analysis, trend analysis, and sharing that information uh, becomes really, really critical. Yes, absolutely, and that requires, I think, a proper risk management framework. Uh, to share all that data, you know, that uh, you come across uh, about the vulnerabilities and security threats. And uh, that, that's where I see another concern too, that nations need to advance cybersecurity risk management and coordination for as cybersecurity, uh, for as cyber technology evolves, so too will the sophistication of cyber threats. As the future of cyberspace, geospace and space is closely tied to how nations manage their cyberspace risk today because the computer core connected computers and internet has you know uh, connected everything cyberspace geospace and space policymakers should place a strong emphasis on advancing the discipline of integrated interdependent interconnected cybersecurity risk management framework to match the evolving threat landscape of cyberspace and i I uh, talked about this before also in this session with uh, that, you know, this is the main concern that I see that we don't have an integrated, interconnected, interdependent framework. So what are your thoughts on the current state of cybersecurity risk management efforts across industries from your perspective? Because you, uh, you, you know, uh, travel so much and you also do a lot of audits and uh, you think that the risk management framework that we have is effective at this point? I think I would talk primarily to information sharing mechanisms uh, because that's where where I see the greatest progress uh, in the actually the last 10 to 15 years uh, the the information sharing organizations can have different names uh, and and somewhat different characters depending on the nation uh, and the industry in particular. Uh, in the U.S., it's been the ISACs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. Uh, the current administration is coming up with a, a new approach called ISAUD, uh, but essentially this, the same type of voluntary organization where companies and the government, where industry and the government comes together to share uh, information on threats. 
some of these uh, ISACs in the U.S. context are much more effective than others. And I, th I think to some extent that's our challenge is to understand what does make uh, an information sharing organization uh, effective. Probably the, the most effective uh, in the U.S. And, and somewhat growing internationally is the FS, the financial sector uh, ISAC. Um, I, I think this is because the, the financial arena can almost directly measure the cost of, of cyber attacks and, and, and cyber risk. And they, and they know it's, it's high for them. And so there's a huge motivation to come together and, and, uh, uh, share information. But frankly, as cyber attacks proliferate uh, across now almost every industry. Uh, we're seeing many of the other ISACs starting to become more effective uh, as well. One of our challenges is, is the fact that some sectors, some industries uh, have not had ISACs. And, and frankly, the, the classic case is, in, is the retail industry with the, the big attacks starting roughly two years ago. Those should have been seen and predicted. Um, we saw the, uh, the attack on a, a large credit card processor uh, using new technology uh, the, the requirements now are that credit cards need to be encrypted throughout the entire transaction process from the store, the point of sale terminal or cash register to the data center where they're decrypted, processed, routed, re-encrypted and sent to the bank for approval from the bank back to the data center and then to the store to authorize the transaction. Essentially, that process is, requires encryption now all the way. What we saw about three years ago were the hackers using memory scrapers or, or RAM scrapers, random access memory, to get at the, uh, the, the transaction during that just brief flash of a second when it's decrypted, never written uh, in an unencrypted form, but they were using memory scrapers in the big processing stacks uh, to get at that data. Then we saw uh, a series of scraper attacks hit three different gross, small grocery store chains. Uh, and now the scrapers, though, had moved from the big processing stacks down to the point of sale terminals in the store. Uh, we should have been able to predict that those attacks would become much more widespread and would now start hitting big stores like Target, uh, Home Depot, Sally B, Lehman Marcus. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't do a good job, again, of analysis of that proactive, as you said it, analysis. And we didn't have a retail ISAC that could explain all that to the retail industry. Um, yes, yes. No, I, I agree with you on that, that there is a need for that integration of all the sectors and all the industries. And so that, you know, as soon as an attack like that happens, that you can share that uh, knowledge and analysis uh, and information across sectors. And it's quickly, you know, implemented. And those vulnerabilities are, you know, quickly fixed. But uh, at this point, we don't have that, you know, framework or we don't have that structure by which we can move forward. That's what I've been telling you, Jim, that we don't have that. And so we are making a great effort in silos. You know, everybody, all industries are working in silos, but silos have a lot of challenges because, you know, everything is interconnected right now. Jay Shree, that's probably where you and I differ, uh, because I think this information only becomes usable in silos. Uh, 
again, the cyber community had access to, to the evolution of, of the RAM scrapers and, and the changing of, of the targeting. Uh, I, it only becomes relevant when, when you can translate it into what does that mean for, in some cases, a, an industry or sector like retail. Uh, it, it only truly becomes useful when you can translate that into what does it mean for my organization? What do I have to do to protect myself? So that's where big organizations, and it, and I don't mean to be negative uh, in this case on uh, on the U.S. cert uh, because that is in the U.S. context. That's that's what U.S. cert does. They they do oversee. Uh, each of the ISACs. Uh, the ISACs also have other government organizations supporting them, but the U.S. CERT's information uh, role, pardon me, is to share that information, share threat information across ISACs. That's such a huge job uh, that I'm not sure it can be done in a meaningful way. Uh, I, I think if we push too far onto a global framework, I, I think we're going to create a huge bureaucracy that will have very limited impact uh, on, on the problem. So I would much, much rather see, let's call them communities, industries, sectors, uh, come together to look at the threats that are relevant to their industry. I, I think that's going to be the key uh, in, in many cases. I, I hear your, you know, thoughts on that, 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 you know, we don't want to create a bureaucracy and I would never, you know, promote creating a bureaucracy, but there is a way to have a really effective integrated structure framework by which, you know, even though you can work in silos, we don't have, everything does not need to be shared. Some silos are essential, like you said, you know, because they are very effective that way. But at the same time, what risks that are going to, you know, transpire, move to other sectors, impact other sectors, we do need to have an ability to quickly, you know, share that information. And that's what the framework I'm talking about. I, I agree with you on this, that the silos are sometimes effective, but silos cannot do everything. And that's where we need an integrated, you know, risk management framework. And we'll continue de debating on this issue, you know, Jim, <laughs> you know, every time we talk about, but let's move to another topic. The, and, and this if is, I could, though, I, before, sure. we leave, before we leave that one, yes. uh, in addition to industry-specific ISACs, uh, there's, there's another dynamic, I guess I would call it, uh, and, and that is the development of information sharing tools. You could say frameworks, and maybe that's accurate, but tools like Sticks and Taxi uh, that, that let companies, governments exchange this information very, very quickly. Uh, uh, Yara is another one. Uh, it, it's it's a framework for writing the rules that go into various security tools. Much of industries come together now. Uh, this much of the security industries come together and said, "We're going to use Yara signatures as the standard, uh, so that other companies." can can also ingest these rules very very quickly and and so you don't have to have each security tool vendor writing their own signatures uh, it, that takes time and effort and threat research and threat intelligence uh, if, if someone's written a rule for this bot uh, this piece of malware let's share it and and let all the cybersecurity tools use it. So I, again, I think there are some very good things that are being done. 
Sticks and Taxi uh, uh, really started by companies coming together. Since then, uh, DHS and the U.S. CERT is, has taken a kind of a sponsoring role and a facilitating role, and, th and that's good. Uh, but I, I, I really, it really brings me back, though, to my original point. We are getting very good at sharing threat information. What we're not good at is doing the analysis to predict the trends. I see. And, I see. and maybe, maybe if there's a, if there's a role for government, uh, maybe that's it. it. Is to somehow uh, facilitate more analysis and <laughs> and sharing of trends. Um, I, and, and the reason I say maybe is I, I'm not overconfident that 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 one's a tough problem to solve. Exchanging threat information uh, is easy, frankly. I see. Uh, so you you are saying that the data is there, information is there, the analysis and understanding of its impact is not there. I hear you on that. I mean, I, I see those challenges too, and I, I there is another, you know very significant challenge based on the same thing that we don't have enough understanding about the strategic risk that we are facing you know because of the cyberspace uh, what innovations would trigger because of cyberspace how it is going to impact the current models the current you know businesses the current industries uh, the current governance framework even the governments they are also at threat because the digitalization of government processes it has already begun across you know some uh, countries so in the coming years we will see digital government so what would happen to the current you know state and current models of the government that we have so that those are huge challenges so that is another point i wanted to discuss with you is that uh, they we perceive a new foundation for competing in the cyberspace each and every nation has that but while innovation in its broadest sense can be approached by both new technologies a new way of doing things. Innovation in cyberspace can be manifested in the form of a new product design, process, approach, marketing approach, or uh, any kind of uh, other approach, way of conducting training, way of banking, shopping, and so on. So, or even diagnosing disease, you know, like uh, Apple's, you know, new, uh, the smartphones, new applications that are coming out, you can measure your blood pressure, you can measure your, uh, check your bl uh, blood sugar and so many things. So, the, the do you see uh, that, you know, the nations, each industries or sectors, they're actively, you know, working towards understanding what are the strategic, what are the innovations that are happening across sectors that would impact their current, you know, survival or sustainability of the business venture or, you know, any venture that they have. What are, what are your observations? Because I feel that, you know, industries are just not paying attention. They are so focused on preventing their network security risk and their computers, you know, uh, being hacked that they, there is not much focus or attention given to, you know, is there any innovation happening across, you know, sector or nation, which is going to come and impact the very survival of the business that we are at? That's a great question. Uh, I guess I do see that type of focus on innovation in, in pockets. Uh, it certainly isn't comprehensive. Um, the one that, that I'm frankly most excited about is, is actually one that government's involved in at the local lev level. Uh, the, the focus in the last two or three years on connected cities and citizen services by, by local governments, I, I think that's, that's huge. Uh, uh, and, and can really change the effectiveness of local governments. Uh, you know, the access that it, it gives citizens to information and services. That I think that's, for me, probably the, the most important part is, unfortunately, so many citizen services 
in the past have involved paperwork in lots of forms and standing in lines. Uh, and, and that's where cyber has the potential to, to really change things. And it, it, it's exciting to, to, uh, to see. Yes, absolutely. Now, this cyberspace innovations and competitors, uh, there are many, including me, I also, you know, share this feeling that they will eventually and inevitably overtake any business, irrespective of industry or nation that stops improving and innovating. Because cyberspace innovators will find a way to innovate around every required advantage and create a better and cheaper way of doing things. Because right now, the, I mean, we have seen, you know, what Amazon has created, what Uber has created, uh, what Netflix has created. There are so many amazing innovations happening in cyberspace that would take away the traditional industry. So the question is that the only way to sustain a competitive advantage for any entity across any nation or industries is to embrace cyberspace, innovate, compete, survive, and sustain. Now, what they can do is they can create more sustainable advantages, uh, but that means that they have to the current advantage, existing advantage that they have in traditional geospace. They have to make it obsolete, even while it is still an advantage. So even if your business is doing really well right now, if it, your industry is doing really well, you have to think that it is obsolete. It is not going to survive more than a couple of years. Or a few years and you have to have that mindset and you have to start innovating so do you see because if you don't do that if this industry doesn't do that or if this business doesn't do that someone else will do it there is such tough competition so do, this reality brings each entity across ngi at in a very interesting juncture what do you see uh, you work with so many you know industries and so many organizations do you see this thought process in the decision makers that whatever we have right now, even though it's very profitable, it's making us billions, it is obsolete. Let's take it like that and let's start, you know, thinking how we can redesign, re-innovate around, you know, what we have. Uh, that That's a, a great question. And uh, I, th I think the biggest challenge there today is probably not to overinvest in infrastructure because as you said uh, infrastructure can so quickly become uh, outdated and 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 even hold organizations back from from progressing because they're so invested in infrastructure ironically that's in, in um many cases potentially an advantage for uh, less developed nations in, in, in the third world uh, because they can almost leapfrog over infrastructures that uh, that would cost them a lot. You know, the wired connections to the home uh, that can be a, a very costly copper uh, or fiber uh, infrastructure. Now with, with uh, wireless and, and mobile devices, you, you, you can almost bypass uh, that, that whole generation. Uh, and, and certainly the same is true not only of nations and, and communities, but, but industry uh, as well. And so one of the things that, that we're doing, and, and we're frankly seeing interest around the world, is uh, establishing what we call cyber innovation centers. Uh, centers that are very flexible, uh, that bring people together in an environment where they can experience some of the newest technology, but more importantly, they can try new processes, new policies, new procedures uh, in, in a simulation environment oftentimes uh, to, to really see what, what they can get from, from some of these new approaches. Uh, we've, over the past year or so, we've stood up a prototype cyber innovation center in Romania, working with the uh, Romanian government 
Uh, obviously, our interest is in security. So uh, the Romanian uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, or, or CHIRT Romania, is the host. Uh, but we've been working with them and industry uh, in Romania to, to stand up a prototype. Uh, what, what we wanted to do is get them uh, kind of the basic components of a center uh, so that they could then better understand the requirements and specifications uh, to, to uh, stand up the full center. And similarly, we now have uh, a dialogue going with uh, Indonesian government and industry to, uh, to stand up a, another cyber innovation center in Indonesia. Uh, the, the beauty of these organizations is they're, they're, they're very flexible. Uh, there is no single right answer for what goes into a cyber innovation center. It needs to depend on the, the sponsoring organizations and, and, and the, the government, the, the culture, uh, and, and what are the key issues that, that you need to a, a address in that context. That but, is good to, that is really good to know. So this innovation, exciting. sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say, it's, it's just really exciting to, to yes. see that kind of, of thinking going yes. on. Yes, absolutely. And those are very essential. I mean, I'm glad that, you know, those innovation centers are uh, coming up, you know, across nations, like you said. Uh, who Who is behind these innovation centers, the industries or the governments? In, interestingly, I think it's the government and industry Coming, Collectively. Uh, coming together. Uh, in the case of, of Romania, uh, it was a couple of Romanian government organizations. Uh, uh, the ministry, it used to be the Ministry for Communications. Now it's the uh, uh, Ministry for Information Society. Uh, uh, great perspective there in, in, yes. in, in the name change. Uh, it was the, uh, the U.S. Embassy coming together with them uh, as well as some Romanian industrial leaders and Fidelis uh, to put this, this idea together. So I, you're right. It, in academia often has a key role to play it, as well. So when you can get those organizations playing together, I, I think it, it can be very powerful. Yes, it could be very powerful. They, we all have you know, a role to play uh, in progress and advancement of our nations. So each industry, each you know, government, each academia, everyone has to you know, work together. And that's what I keep you know, pushing and you know, I keep promoting that we need to have an integrated, you know, approach of, you know, solving a lot of, you know, major problems. And like you said, these Romania and other nations, they have these innovation centers happening, which is great. And I uh, hope that we see that, you know, across uh, uh, all nations, you know, so that, you know, we can take the benefit of this amazing innovation, which is cyberspace. And we can, you know, translate that and, you know, Come, come up with you know very useful tools and technologies and innovations that can help us advance you know uh, collectively as a, a humanity and we can uh, progress uh, in positive direction this is the now last question that i am you know uh, we are going to talk about i've taken so much of your time gm it's early morning you i am so you know uh, grateful that you came this early to your office so that we can have this dialogue uh, in spite of your very busy schedule and that shows your commitment and your you know passion about this field what is that one thing you would like to change as to how nations strategize cybersecurity wow that's that that's a big one um, and and i i want to think about that just a little bit because the the uh, question uh, uh, is so important um, I, I think I would circle back on a couple of things that we've we've talked about. Um, one is the recognition that the technology is important, so we do need to continue to foster uh, the the evolution of technology. I mean, frankly, the for us the classic 
is the way the advanced attacks today have been effective in getting around the traditional security walls like firewalls and, and antivirus and intrusion detection systems. That, that's led to a whole new category of tools called advanced threat defense or advanced threat detection. So we have to continue to, to evolve in the, the technology arena. Uh, but I do in particular want to circle back on, on people. Uh, and and the, again, the combination of technology, people, and, and process or, or policy. Uh, I think people may be the area where we can take some of the biggest steps. And, and again, it, it's through training, education, and awareness, and, and it's, it's making a, a lot of that not only more powerful, but fun through things like cyber, cyber competitions. It's, uh, you know, the, the chance to work with kids uh, and, and uh, again, see how excited they can be about defending a network. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're not only looking at giving them career opportunities and, and stimulating their interest in, in science and technology and, and engineering at, at an early age. But these kids are going home and in many cases they're, they're telling some of us who didn't grow up in the cyber age, uh, telling their parents, uh, you know, what they need to be doing to, uh, uh, to be, cyber safe. So I, I, I think the people, again, I've, I've become a technology geek, uh, but, but coming back to people is, is really exciting. Yes, you're absolutely right. Coming back to people is exciting. So thank you very much, Jim, for sharing all your thoughts and wisdom and all your uh, experience that you have gained over the years. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure our global viewers and listeners are going to benefit tremendously from what you had to say. And I hope that as we move forward, uh, we I mean, this is such a huge topic. We were not even able to address 0.1% of what we need to be talking about. There's so much more to talk. But this was the basic, you know, the first dialogue that we had on uh, strategizing cybersecurity. So I hope that, you know, you would be willing to come on Risk Roundup again and share your uh, input about, you know, how to strategize network security and uh, uh, the areas that we, you know, uh, uh, in the future we can uh, discuss that. And I think that would be really good that, you know, the nations would have an opportunity to hear about what you had to say about this. So thank you, Jim. Great. I, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So the countless connections forged by cyberspace technologies have brought each nation uh, tremendous benefits who uses the web to tap into humanity's collective store of knowledge every day. Uh, however, as data breaches are becoming even bigger and more common, lack of security in the cyberspace, geospace and space has become the obstacle to success of the digital global age. Though the, the, though the uh, problem resides in cybersecurity technologies, the solution undoubtedly requires effective policies and practices that focus more on the collective NGIOA approach rather than only on the technology. Nations need to take a lead and establish a culture of NGIOA collaboration. When NGIOA collaborates, the nation will be uh, characterized by clear, effective governance policies and standards. This will create a scenario of innovation, progress, and development in which the collective action of government, industries, organizations, and academia will foster the widespread and rapid adoption of cyberspace and its technologies to fulfill its potential. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center is created for this very reason so that we can collectively identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS, and we can have a, a, in, experts like you know Jim come on Risk Roundup and share their viewpoints so that we can collectively identify what the security challenges are and how we can overcome that. So because we at Risk Group believe that risk management, 
security and peace walk together hand in hand though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict and it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two all three concepts feed into each other we believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations tradition becomes our security so if we build a culture of managing risk effectively it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace let's manage the existing and emerging risk together for more information on the risk roundups to watch the risk roundup videos or to hear the risk roundup podcast please go to riskgroupalancy.com do not forget to subscribe and share until next time i'm jayshree pandya your host of risk roundup signing off see you next time thank you